Hey everyone, Michael here. So in this video, I want to show you how I use the company report when I first start researching a stock because for my whole investment process, I typically start by looking at a stock and how it performs on the company report and then I do more due diligence after that from what I've learned. So today we're going to look at Intel and the reason being is because they recently reported around October 20 and even though it performed relatively well, it, uh, the stock declined quite significantly. And the reason was, was because the forecast for the future were quite uh, suppressed, as in they were expecting not much growth. So the stock's pulled back a bit, and I'm interested because A, it's in the semiconductor industry, and it's quite uh, a growing uh, industry that's increasing importance as more technology advances. And B, it's a blue chip stock, so it's been around for quite a few decades now. And even though it's been around for quite a few decades, the industry that it's in has quite good prospects. So I want to look into the business and how it's performing now. And then basically I'll show you what I'll look into next to decipher if um, it has any like better prospects that may not be appreciated. So that's what I'm going to look into today. And uh, I'll show you how I review the report. So obviously I start at the top here. And the first thing I check out is the snowflake. And just from a glance there, I can see that it, it looks like a potential value stock. Uh, and it has a quite a reliable dividend. Uh, relatively solid balance sheet, um, relatively okay track record, um, but its future prospects don't seem good at all. And so that's what I want to look into. Like I want to assess each of these areas and see why it got the scores that it did in those particular cases. So for those of you who don't know, um, if you're not familiar with the stock, it basically designs, manufactures, and sells essential technologies for a lot of different industries like the cloud, um, connected devices, retail, and um, basically any sort of uh, PC centric or computer centric sort of uh, industry. So it has different businesses like the PC centric business, uh, it has a data center group, it has an Internet of Things group, all where it provides sort of chips and semiconductors for those um, computers to work. So just to quickly go over the next few things that I look at, I look at the risks and rewards. So the first thing here I can see is that apparently with the rewards, it's trading at quite a good discount, 36% below simply Wall Street's estimate of fair value. And I know that that fair value is based on the analyst estimates of its future cash flows, and it's then discounted back to today's value. So I'll have a look at that soon. Uh, and the next reward it says is it pays a reliable dividend of 2.74%. Now that's pretty good. It's not the highest yield in the market, but it's a pretty good return. So that's one thing I'll look into in more detail soon too. The next thing it says is the risks. And now it says earnings are forecast to decline by an average of almost 6% per year for the next three years. So that's not exactly encouraging and that kind of provides context as to why it doesn't score well in the future section at all. Um, so I'll look more into that as well. And it says it has a high level of debt. So that's a bit concerning. Uh, I'll try and get some more color on if that debt is going to be affordable or not. So the next part I scroll down to is the competitors. And as I mentioned, I know already of some of the competitors, the likes of NVIDIA, and AMD and just having a look here I can see already at a high level how they perform in comparison to Intel so while Intel might be a value and a dividend stock uh, Nvidia seems to be much more or much better track record um, and more of a future uh, higher expectations of future growth um, Broadcom seems to have an okay dividend very solid track record uh, Texas Instruments good dividend good health great past not too good in value or future uh, and AMD seems to have outstanding health um, in terms of its balance sheet, uh, very good track record and good future prospects as well. So if I'm looking for stocks with like better, better track records and better future prospects, then I may actually have a look at the likes of AMD. So once I finish looking at Intel, I'm going to want to have a look at its competitors because I know these guys all operate in similar industry. And so I want to see which one is likely to have the best sort of performance. So to get an idea of Intel, I'm also going to want to look at its competitors. And this sort of review that I'm doing of the company report now, I'll do the same thing for these guys too. So that'll be something that I do in uh, after the video. The next thing I look at is the price history and performance. So as we can see here, it's actually been pretty flat over the last year. $45 this time last year, and it's now $51 roughly. Um, so not too much growth, but it's been, it seems to have had a bit of a volatile year in that sense where expectations were pretty high leading up until March, uh, but then seems to have tapered off a bit since then. So while I don't use this sort of um, price chart movement to dictate whether to buy or sell, uh, as you've probably seen in some of our other videos, uh, I use this section to get an idea of the company's underlying developments. So for example, I want to have a look here 
and see what particular strategy developments there were here. So Disrupt X announces partnership with Intel Internet of Things Alliance to launch cognitive neuron Internet of Things platform. So this just, as I read through these, and there's plenty of others as you can see, as I read through these, these give me some context of how, uh, what, different, what different things are going on in the underlying business uh, and how they impact the share price movements. So I won't do that here in this video because it's um, a bit of a long process, but what, what I would do and what I would recommend is reading through these developments to see what's occurring. Um, and it was with the Intel Core unveils the 12th gen Intel Core processor family. That was only a uh, couple of weeks ago. So reading through those will help get me some more color on what's happened uh, and what is uh, uh, going on in the underlying business. The next part is very similar to that. So I read through the recent news and updates. And again, I won't do it in this video, but just to explain why is I want to get more of an understanding of what is going on. And so uh, we have uh, all the collection of the news articles provided by our internal news team here. So I'll have a read through them. And there's also updates, stuff like the dividend, which it looks like I've just missed. I had to buy it before November 4th uh, to get paid on the December 1st. Um, there's stuff here as well, like executive VP um, exercising options. Um, and then there's a few articles as well from external news sources that weren't written by us, that are written by other authors. And we have a partnership with Seeking Alpha. And so these provide other authors or other investors uh, opinion on what they think of the stock. And I like reading these articles as well. And I can even get a quick summary of their articles too by just reading the dot points that are provided here. Uh, but I like reading these too, the positive and the negative, because they help provide me with context um, on both why, why you would be bullish on a stock or why you might be bearish on a stock. So if I'm already a bit optimistic or biased at the start, I don't want to cloud my judgment by only reading optimistic stuff and have a bit of confirmation bias. I want to read both. I want to read why people don't think it's as good. And then by knowing that information, I can then make an informed decision and be like, okay, I do agree with that. Um, and then I become less, less sort of um, optimistic about it or more realistic about it. So yeah, reading through all these and then I can see more updates as well. Reading through all these will give me um, a great sort of overview of the business as well. More qualitative data rather than quantitative, while it does bring up numbers, of course. Um, the next thing I look at is the shareholder returns. So as we saw above, it's been relatively good for this year, like about almost 10% for the, for the year. Um, but its competitors in the semiconductor space in the US have just had a tear of a year, um, gaining 54%, which is just huge. Um, and that's the likes of NVIDIA and AMD. So uh, that has actually outperformed the US market. So the US market has also had an awesome year of 28%, uh, but still actually underperforms the semiconductor industry. So Intel has been pretty uh, sluggish in that sense. Um, and that, that makes sense because like, it, like we said, its future prospects don't look as good. So we'll get into more details um, on that shortly. And this next part also just tells me about volatility. I'm not too concerned about that, but it's just interesting to know. Um, it's less volatile than the industry, um, and the industry is roughly in line with the market. So Intel just seems to be like a more reliable blue chip sort of stock that doesn't move around too much. Uh, next is the about the company section, and uh, Intel is a very wide, uh, a wide ranging business where it has a lot of um, businesses within it. And so the, reading this about the company just gives me more details on exactly what they do. Um, and so that's also useful to read through. If it's a business that you really don't have much first-hand exposure to, like if it's not a, a product you use every day, or if it's a bit more techy, like this company, and you're not too techy yourself, these sort of things are very interesting to read because they provide a lot of, a lot of help. Uh, the next part I look at is the fundamental summary. So this just provides me some core metrics. And we can see here, the company's got a market cap of 206 billion, uh, revenue of 78 billion and earnings of 21 billion. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, P ratio of 9.8. Now that's incredibly low. Um, and that might be why the company's scoring so well in the value section. Uh, but I know that um, looking at value just by itself, uh, I have to look, is not wise. I have to look at the company's future prospects as well so that I can get some context and color on if the valuation makes sense. And so a really cheap P ratio like, or sorry, cheap P ratio like this being 9.8 might be justified if I look at the future prospects. If the future prospects aren't good, which we'll get to in a second, then that might explain why investors aren't willing to pay such a high multiple for it because they don't think there's much growth there. So I'll get some more details on that soon. And price to sales ratio is basically just the same multiple of what the market cap is versus its revenue. Um, and I usually typically only use that for like unprofitable companies and how to compare uh, loss-making companies, so it's not too meaningful to me in, the, in this instance. 
Uh, and next, I just get an overview of the underlying earnings and revenue and how, it, how it's broken down. And this really helps just to provide some more color as well. So in order to generate its $78 billion worth of revenue, I can see here that it has cost of revenue, which is like the cost of producing its parts and its hardware and its semiconductor chips. Uh, the cost of producing those is about $34 billion. So it has pretty good gross margins of about 56%. Um, that's, that's pretty decent. And that leaves it with a gross profit of $44 billion. And then once it has that cash, what it does, it, is, has, it has operating expenses or expenses of running its business of about $23 billion. And that's made up of stuff like R&D, um, sales and marketing, general and admin, the kind of cost that it has to incur for, doing, for um, conducting its business. And then once it's incurred all those expenses, uh, it's left over with $21 billion worth of earnings. So pretty good net margins and the net profit margins are 26%. So pretty impressive. Um, that's, that's good. It gives it room to either invest more in its, uh, in, its, in its business in terms of like maybe it would want to increase its sales and marketing or it would want to increase its research and development in order to increase the top line. Like it's basically, because it has net profit margins like that, it has a bit of room if it wants to increase those things. doesn't necessarily have to, but at least has, has the opportunity. Uh, and the debt to equity ratio is about 44%. So anything above 40 is considered relatively high. So uh, when I get to the health section, I'll be able to look into more detail there and see if it is affordable. Uh, next, we have the dividends, which is just what we were seeing before. Pays a yield of 2.7%, which is pretty good. It just paid a yield of a dividend the other day, or went X dividend the other day. It's going to pay in early December, so I've missed that. And its payout ratio is about 26%. Now that's how much uh, the dividend is of the earnings that it has. And considering it's a dividend payout ratio of 26%, that's pretty low, very, very low, meaning it can, um, it can afford to increase the dividend if it wanted to, and it wouldn't be like uh, too much of a burden on its, under, on its earnings. Uh, and also if earnings were to decrease a bit, um, I don't think the dividend would be at too much risk of being cut, but I'll get into, I'll find out more details about that in the future section and dividend too. So the next part I look at is valuation. And ultimately, why would I look at valuation? Well, no company is worth an infinite price. And so the idea of investing is you want to buy undervalued companies uh, and then like eventually the market realizes or, your, or the, the market gets up to speed on what actually occurs in the business in a couple of years time and then come, the business reaches its full potential that um, not many people saw. So the idea is you want to pay up an attractive price for a business that has room to grow. So According to Simply Wall Street's uh, analysis checks, it passes five of the six. So let's see where it does well. Um, what I'm looking at here is basically, okay, it's about 36% undervalued. Um, Simply Wall Street's model says it's worth about $79 per share. And I know that that's based off the analyst estimates of future cash flows. And I typically just want to get more details on this. So I look at the view data here and it shows me all the inputs. It shows me the discount rate, which is the cost of equity. It shows me the perpetual growth rate, which is like what it expects the company to grow in perpetuity. Um, and it shows me the valuation model it used and also all the other inputs there. So I'll come back to that in more details later. But one thing I keep in mind is that it's based off analyst estimates. So as the company continues to um, you know, operate its business and like comes out with new news and new developments, um, analysts will change their forecasts. So this isn't static. It will change as analyst estimates change. So I just keep an eye on it, um, but it's interesting to know that according to the cash flows that are expected to happen in the future, um, it could potentially be undervalued at today's price. So something to keep in mind, but this definitely isn't telling me it's a buy uh, decision. It's just saying according to this model, it could be undervalued. So as I go and do more research on it, I'll get more color and then I'll be able to make my own judgment call about whether I think today's price is fair enough or not. And I can and then do my own fair value as well. So it passes those two checks, um, being both below and significantly below the fair value. Um, and in terms of the price to earnings ratio, it compares very favorably against the market industry. So as we saw before, it's got a, it's got a PE of 9.8, uh, which is considered very good in the green. Um, and the industry has a PE of about 30, so it's much, much higher. Uh, and the market is about 18 at the moment. So it's a trading, trading at quite a discount to, those, uh, to the industry and market. But I can't just take that by itself. I need to then go to the next section in future growth in just a moment and look at all their future um, earnings growth expectations. And then that'll give me more color um, as to why they might be trading higher. So next is the price to earnings growth ratio. This isn't too meaningful to me, so I don't usually typically use it, but it basically just compares the current price to its future growth. 
um, and it's negative, so it looks like it's actually expected to have negative growth. <laughs> I'll find out more in the future section. And price to book, um, if you know these videos, I don't typically use price to book too much unless it's like I'm looking at an industrials or a financial stock, um, which is ones where they typically have, they generate a lot of their profits from their asset base. Um, but if you still use this ratio, it looks like it's trading at a cheaper valuation than the market and industry. So positive if you might, if you do want to look at that. Okay, now here's where it looks like the issue might be. So future growth, <laughs> it doesn't pass any of the checks, unfortunately, um, and we'll look into more details now. So there's, pardon me, 38 analysts covering the stock, so plenty of people with their eyes on it. Um, but it looks like it has it, it, expectations of 6% uh, earnings decline per year for the next um, couple of years. So now let's get a visual representation of that. What I look for is usually I want to see things going from... Um, where they are to the top right, uh, up and to the right. Uh, but in this case, it doesn't seem to be the case. So we can see here that earnings have been kind of, earnings and revenue have been somewhat like steady and maybe a bit choppy over these last couple of years, um, back to 2018. But starting from here, the third quarter of 2021, it looks like revenue and earnings are just both expected to drop. Um, Earnings more so. Um, looks like, yeah, revenue down from 78 billion to 73, 73, then recovered to 76 by the end of 2023. Uh, but if I look at earnings, it's expected to go from about 21 billion. This is trailing 12 months data, by the way, so it's not per quarter, it's trailing 12 months. Um, they're expected to go from 21 billion to 14 billion. So, okay, there must be a reason why as to earnings are expected to decrease um, that much, considering revenue isn't expected to decrease that much. Um, and in terms of free cash flow and cash flow from operations, okay, so they're also expected to decline quite a bit. This cash flow from operations is the cash that the company generates from its core business, and the free cash flow is basically um, the cash generated after the business has done all of its like expenditure, like capital capital expenditure, um, investing in like longer term assets and stuff like that, and or paying out dividends and stuff. So, looks like that's expected to decline quite significant significantly. Um, and it's somewhat concerning. So I'm going to look into, basically going to look into like what they're doing. And from the news that I've been hearing recently, like Intel has said that it wants to invest billions of dollars into generating um, or into improving its foundry, uh, in foundry services. And it's um, expected to spend, I think it was like 25 billion per year or maybe or somewhere around that for a couple of years in order to build facilities in the likes of the United States and Europe um, in order to then handle all the semiconductor demand, so it can um, b b basically meet meet um, customers' expectations and demand. So that might be the reason why these are free cash flows are to decline so much because it's investing so much in its capital expenditures. Um, but as for cash flow from operations, I'm just curious as to why that is. So um, when I go and when I finish this report, I'll go and have a look at the. Um, the articles, like I said, to get more color, but I'll also go have a look at the annual report and just look at what the company has shared on its future expectations as to why they expect to see revenue and earnings decline um, to provide more color again. Um, and I also want to then look if like this is a permanent sort of thing or if it's like just temporary and they see that only for the next few years they expect this decline to occur um, and then they expect it to improve. Because if that's the case, like if it's trading at cheap multiples right now because everyone has and their eyes set on in the next couple of years that's fine i could be patient i can wait five ten years for the for the um for these next couple of years worth of investments to then pay off so that might be that is something i'm going to look at um if everyone's just only looking two three years out um, i want to look like five ten years out and um, because i don't think semiconductors are going anywhere i want to see if there's like still a, a space in the market for intel to do well so that's something i'll look into um, and then yes, so this next part I look at is the forecast I was talking about for the future earnings. And basically this here provides me more color as to the PE ratio I saw above. So while we may have looked at the above one and said 9.8, super cheap, it's like, well, it's super cheap because the company is expected to have its earnings decline by f almost 6% for the next couple of years. So you may, 9.8 may look cheap, but that, this is why, like its earnings are actually expected to decline as we saw above as well. Um, and then the industry and market, they were trading, industry was like 30p and market was about 18.2. Um, so they're expected to have pretty decent earnings growth of about 14.5%. So that's why they're trading at a higher multiple. And then as for the revenue growth, like we saw, it's actually expected to decline over the next couple of years, but it's um, probably expected to improve after that. 
So very low earnings growth, almost basically flat. Um, and then the industry and market are around 10%. So that's why they're trading. That's probably also supporting why they're trading at a higher multiple. There's just bigger expectations of growth for both the industry and the market compared to Intel. So if I'm not interested in like, oh, if I find out that I'm not interested in Intel because of these short-term things, then I think it's going to be longer term. Um, then what I'll do is I'll go look at the US semiconductor industry and I might then have a look at NVIDIA or Broadcom or Texas or AMD and then have a look at them and see how they're, how, how they're faring in terms of their future growth because Intel clearly might not be a good opportunity according to these forecasts. Um, so the competitors might actually be a better investment. Um, and if they're not, if I still don't like what I find there, then I can look at the market as well and just filter for anything um, above like 14% and then I can see what I'm looking for. So yeah, as we can see here, all the checks that Simply Wall Street's done in the analysis model, it doesn't pass any of them, unfortunately. Um, so it's future prospects in the next couple of years don't look too good. And this earnings per share growth forecast is basically shows me the range of analyst estimates because that chart above was the average of analyst estimates. This one shows me the range of their earnings per share estimates. So these are gap earnings per share, generally accepted accounting principles. And basically this thick blue line is the uh, actual earnings per share on a trailing 12 months basis. And the shaded blue area is analyst estimates. So it looks like it outperformed um, during early 2020, uh, but then kind of met analyst expectations here in the first half of 2021. Uh, improved and out, out, surpassed, surpassed um, expectations here. But then, as we can see here, they all collectively seem to agree that there's going to be a big decline in the earnings per share. Um, and I'll go and have a look into why that is. Um, but yeah, we can see here that even the most optimistic analyst uh, still expects earnings to decline to $4.39 per share from $5.10. And the most pessimistic one expects $2.88. Um, they seem to improve, like the most pessimistic ones see it in end of 2023, they bottom out, um, but then they expect them to improve by the end of 2023. So yeah, something to keep in mind, but just the general consensus is they do expect earnings per share to decline, which is again, reinforces the fact of why it's trading so cheaply. Uh, now the future return on equity, and basically I look at this to just see if the company has, has any profitable initiatives they can still invest its shareholders money into. Um, and it looks like it does, but they don't generate the highest return. So it's roughly in line with the industry, about 15-16%, uh, but it's not exactly a high rate of return. Anything above 20% is really good. So in the future, um, which this I think should be three years time. Uh, okay, no, it doesn't tell me. Oh yeah, that's right, three years time. So it, it doesn't seem to be as profitable, but that's what we saw above. Like they don't expect it to gener generate that much money off its investments. Now that can either be because they're reinvesting very heavily or because just the in initiatives that they are investing in aren't as profitable. So I'm going, to go on a, I'm going to want to go and do some research, find out what they're investing in, and then see if this is like a short-term thing or if they're investing a lot of money to generate longer-term profits. Um, that'll give me some color as to this number because if it's like in five years' time, it's better, or 10 years' time, it might be better, then that's okay. But for this shorter term, it doesn't seem to be passing too well. Now, the next part I look at is past performance. So you can see here it actually passes three of the six checks from um, Simply Wall Street, and that's pretty good. So annual historical earnings growth of 15% per year is pretty decent. Uh, we can see here that, or what I look for, is basically like a trend. And we can see here that there has been sort of a trend. It may have been a bit choppy at times, but it's basically been on like a, a, a steady upward trajectory um, over the longer term. Relatively flat over here though, but then since 2017 it's, it's improved. So what I also want to look for here is the operating expenses. And this just kind of gives me some color as to like how much, uh, if their operating expenses, I should say, have been increasing or decreasing as time's gone on and how that's impacted its margins. So if we have a look here, we can see that the margins were about 17.4% back in 2016 um, with revenue of like 60 billion and, and earnings of like 10 billion. Um, so profit margins of 17.4%, well, we saw above that they're now like 26, 26 27%. So what's that, what that tells me is that the company has been able to increase the top line without having to increase its operating expenses too much, which is great because ultimately that means more money has been coming down at the bottom line. As we can see there, its uh, net profit margins have increased like 10%, which is great. And that's only over four or five years. So that's good. I, I like seeing that. Um, but that's past performance. And as we saw from the future, revenue and earnings are both expected to decline a bit. So... That might not be the case, like margins will, might be a bit lower going forward, um, but as for the backwards looking thing, it's proven that it can do it. 
and it has high quality earnings. So this tells me also that what I want to look for here is um, does it have any one-off items that are impacting its results um, like significantly? Does it have any huge one-off expenses that just like distort the numbers heaps? In this case, it doesn't. And also this check is because it wants to show me the free, the cash flow conversion. Like is the company generating cash profits, not just accounting profits. And um, the difference between cash and accounting profits is cash is like cold hard cash that you would see in the cash flow um, and see in the cash flow statement. And earnings are accounting profits and they're impacted by non-cash expenses like depreciation and amortization, which the company doesn't actually pay cash for. Um, so yeah, basically what this is telling me is it has quality earnings. The company's earnings that you see in the income statement do flow through as cash to the cash flow statement. So good to see that it passes that check. Um, however, its net profit margins are lower than they were last year. So like it's just been a bit of a decline recently, but for me, they're over up over the longer term, which is good. Next part is just the past earnings growth analysis, and this pretty much just shows us what we saw like in the future, but it's actually backwards looking, and it just focuses on earnings over five and one years. So it's been roughly in line in t uh, with the industry, semiconductor industry, so it's about 15% earnings growth. It's outperformed the market, it's pretty good, um, but as for the last year, its earnings have declined. Um, the semiconductor industry has had a whopping good year uh, at 81% earnings growth, and the market grew about 41%, which is huge. So yeah, Intel's really underperformed this past year. So it doesn't pass these checks, passes the five year check, but as for the shorter term in industry, it doesn't pass, pass those. Next thing I look at is return on equity. So it actually seems like return on equity is pretty good right now. The future of return on equity isn't expected to be as good, but um, right now it's actually allocating shareholders equity pretty well. So it's generating a return on equity of 23% versus the industry of 16. So that's all well and good now, but it's not expected to be as good in the future, which is a shame. Um, but at least it's showing me right now it can allocate the money well. The next thing I look at is the return on assets and return on capital employed. Similar sort of metrics, basically this just shows the kind of profit it generates from its asset base and this return on capital shows me how well it allocates um, its capital rather than just equity. So that's current, uh, total assets minus current liabilities and it tells me that it has actually been decreasing here. So 20% three years ago when it's 16% now, it's a bit of a shame. Um, and the return on assets is basically just above the industry. So it's pretty stock standard. There's nothing outstanding there. Now, the next part I look at is financial health. And so I can see here it passes four of the six analysis checks. Um, and that's good. I'll, I'll find out why. So this first part I look at is basically the current, uh, sorry, short-term assets and short-term liabilities and long-term assets and long-term liabilities. And what I want to look for here is the company's like liquidity, pretty much. So these two checks confirm for me that it does have a lot of liquidity and it can handle its short-term liabilities and long-term liabilities, sorry. So it has 61 billion in short-term assets, which is things like cash and cash equivalents. Um, and so they can, if it needed to, if all these liabilities came due for whatever reason, it could easily pay them with its short-term assets. Um, and the next check is we want to check if short-term assets can cover long-term liabilities, just in case for whatever reason the long-term liabilities came due. And in this case, it can also pass them. So if they came due, uh, it can pay off the 48 billion with some of the 61 billion that it has. So it's, it's good in that in that sense. Um, or it's got a solid balance sheet in that sense. Um, so the next part I look at is the debt to equity history ratio um, or history analysis. And basically what I look for here is how the company is utilizing debt in its capital structure. So I can see here that the equity has been increasing over the years, and this is stuff like retained earnings. So when they everything they don't pay out as a dividend or don't reinvest in the business, these retained earnings have been growing, which is great. Um, but I can see here also that the company has been increasing its um, use of debt. So back in 2014, it had about $30 billion worth of debt, and now it has $40 billion. Um, and its cash balance has been increasing as well, which is good to see the cash is increasing. It's nearly like enough to surpass its debt. Uh, but this check here shows me that the debt to equity ratio is considered high. So just anything about 40% is relatively high, and that's just something to keep in mind. So it hasn't necessarily been reducing its debt over the past five years. It's still actually been roughly at 44%. It's just been progressively increasing. So it's been pretty steady as a part of its capital structure. It's always used around 44% over the last couple of years. Um, so it's not necessarily reducing its debt, which um, is a shame. Now, as for the debt it does have, though, it seems like it's very affordable. Um, it's well covered by operating cash flow, 
Um, so that's the cash flow they generate from its core business. In, it has about 84% coverage. So in just over one year, it could pay with its operating cash flow, if it needed to, it could pay off all that debt. So it's relatively well covered in that sense. And as for the earnings, uh, sorry, the interest it has to pay on that debt, it's well covered by the earnings before interest and tax, uh, 50 times coverage. So it's got plenty of room um, to afford the interest repayments. So it can afford the debt that it does have. And the next part I look at is the balance sheet. And what I check for here is just to see how the whole balance sheet is, is laid out. I can see it has 60 billion in physical assets, um, 52, 55 sorry, billion in long-term and other assets. And basically just what I typically try and get an, um, an eye for here is like that what I was looking at above, the cash and short-term equivalents, because I know there's a very liquid assets that it can use um, to pay off its sort of obligations. And as we saw, it's about 34 billion. Um, and it has debt of about 40 billion. So worst comes to worst, it could pay off that debt, um, m most, most of it relatively quickly, um, but it would need to then rely on things like maybe dispensing a lot of its inventory, like it might have to sell them at um, uh, fire sale prices in order to help pay off that debt if the debt became due. So what I'm gonna look at now, because the cash doesn't cover its short term, it doesn't cover its debt obligations, what I'm actually going to do, go do is I'm going to look at the annual report and I'm going to go and look at the details of the debt and I'm going to look at the maturity dates. So basically when the debt is due and it probably it's typically not just one loan of $40 billion. It might be a whole bunch of different loans made up that add up to $40 billion. So I'm going to look at when they're all due and that will give me an idea of the cash flow that they might need to pay it off when they need to pay it off. So the company can either choose to retire the debt and repay the loan or it could actually maybe choose to refinance it. So what I'll look at is like the maturity structure. So if they're all coming due next year, then the company might have a problem because it doesn't have exactly enough cash right now to pay, due, pay them all off. So if they're all due in a couple of years, then it won't be as big of a deal. Um, that's just to let you know what I'll look into next. Uh, but other than that, everything looks okay. Uh, and then the next part is dividends. So this, this company is quite a good dividend stock. It passes five of the six analysis checks uh, and its yield seems pretty good. So it's not exactly the highest yielding stock in the market, but um, it's pretty good. Like the market bottom is 1.3% and this company is paying 2.7. So not bad. Um, and then the next part I want to look at is the stability and growth of the dividend payments. So this blue line here shows me the dividend yield. And that always just depends on the stock price that it was trading at, um, at that particular time in history. And pardon me, this teal line here shows me the dividend they've paid per share. And straight away from looking at this, I can tell it's had a very solid couple of, almost a decade of increasing the dividend progressively. Um, so that's great to see. Now the next part I check out is I click the earnings per share and I wanna see how that has performed relative to the dividend. So, oh, the dividend payments. So I can see here that in 2015, they were paying out 96 cents per share. And again, this is trailing 12 months data. Um, and the earnings per share in June, shortly after that, was $2.43. So that's a very conservative payout ratio. Um, less than 50% of earnings were getting paid out of dividends. And it seems like that has pretty much continued along the way. Like back here, $4.56 in earnings. Um, they were paying out a dividend of about $1.26. So yeah, even more conservative than before. Um, and that seems to have played out for the whole time. So they're paying a growing dividend, which is great to see. And it's actually been quite um, conservative in terms of the payout ratio. So stable for the past 10 years and they've increased for the past 10 years. Great, great to see. Next part I check out is just the current payout ratio. And the reason why is because if the company's paying out a huge part of its earnings as a dividend, well then if anything were to happen to those earnings, the dividend would be at risk, right? If earnings were to decline like 20% one year for whatever reason, then the company would have to be like, oh God, like we have to take on cash, oh sorry, use some of our cash to pay the dividend or some even worse case scenario, which you don't want to see is a company taking on debt to meet um, dividend expectations. Um, so that's like a worst case scenario. But in this case, that doesn't seem to be a concern. We've got the company paying out right now, 26% of its earnings, even though those earnings were, de um, were declining, it's over just a couple of percent. Um, it's still not paying out that much of its earnings as a dividend, which is great because it means it has the remainder um, 74% to reinvest in the business or keep as a cash balance um, to, to then allocate at some other time. So it's good to see that it's very conservative with its dividend, even though it has been growing um, over the years. So I can see here that the future payout ratio is it actually expected to be a bit higher than it is right now. And the reason is just because that earnings are actually expected to be lower in the future. So that's a shame, but it's good to see that even though earnings are expected to decline quite a bit, 
um, the payout ratio is actually still stable. So what that tells me is that um, the company has the ability to still pay uh, its dividend, uh, even if it does potentially actually continue to sort of do its minor increases in its dividend, it doesn't seem to be at too big of a risk. So that's a great tick for me. So it performs well in the dividend side of things. Uh, and the next step I look at is management. So basically, why do I look at management? Well, ultimately, these people are the ones allocating shareholders money, and they're the ones running the business. So what I want to assess here is like, uh, is management aligned with shareholders? Do they have a large, like as in, do they have a large holding of the stock? Um, do they have a lot of experience working at the company and uh, being within the business? Uh, and then basically the next part will show me, have they had any like sort of insider trading that they've been doing in terms of like, um, not trading, sorry, transactions, <laughs> like the legal kind. Um, have they been doing, is, is there any transactions from insiders that have been like, they've been buying heaps or they've been selling heaps? Um, so that also gives me like a sort of weak signal. It's not a strong signal as to whether I should buy or not. It just gives me a weak signal as to like whether they're optimistic on the stock or negative. Um, and also another reason I'll look at that is to try and, uh, uh, what I'll do when I'm looking into those transactions is I'll look at the particular tr um, trades on the SEC filings when they, when they say like they've done a trade. I'll look at the details and I'll see like if it was a, a plan, like they already had predetermined they were going to make that sale or if it was like a one-off sale that they had to do for, for whatever financial reasons. So just to get some color on why the person might have been selling. So I'll get to that a bit later. But here we have the bit on the CEO. And so what I look for is just to basically see, this is obviously the top dog, and I want to see what their um, experience is and what their, what their expertise are. And I think I know from, from what I've heard about Pat Gelsinger is he's actually worked at Intel before. Um, yeah, he joined Intel in 1979, um, and he's actually worked at um, quite a few bits of the business. So I think he's now come back recently, and even so, even though his tenure is very short, I know that from thanks to this sort of profile here, he's actually worked at Intel before in many different roles, um, 1992 to 1996, 1979. So yeah, he's been there quite a long time. Um, and what I would do is I would read read, read this in more in uh, in more depth, um, just to get a better idea of uh, who the CEO is. So the next part I look at is the leadership team. And as I mentioned, what I'm going to look for is experience and um, exposure, like how much skin they have in the game. So um, also, just like the profile I read for the CEO there, I'll have a look at the profiles for each of these members of the leadership team just to get a better idea of, it's just like I would with the CEO, who they are, um, how long they've been there, how much they're compensated, um, and how much they earn in the stock. So just having a quick look here, for those that have provided data, um, it looks like there's actually only a couple of million invested by these by these people here who do uh, provide data. So it's interesting to see they really don't have that much skin in the game. Like, yes, it's a couple of million, um, but for a $206 billion company, maybe you'd expect more of an ownership stake than a couple of million. Um, but especially since some of them have been there for many years. So I don't know, like just... I would like to see more ownership, and it would uh, it would be great to see a higher sort of stake from the leadership team, but um, that's not a huge red flag for me. It just means that like maybe they maybe they receive a lot of compensation in stock, but I would prefer to see higher ownership considering how big the business is. So just something I'll keep in mind. Um, and so they are experienced though, according to this, they've basically got an average tenure over two years. So that means there's not like a high staff turnover. Basically they do tend to stick around for a, a bit, which is good to see. Um, the board members, next section I look at, basically the exact same thing, skin in the game and experience. So I'll read through these profiles here, get a bit of an idea of them, um, see how long they've been at the company, see how much they're compensated and see how much ownership they have in the stock. And again, it seems like a similar sort of story. Like some of them have been there for quite a while. Um, 12 years here, four years, three years, 1.8, 1.4, 5.3. Um, but they all typically don't have the biggest holdings. Like it's a fair bit of money and I obviously don't know the rest of their personal finances. But um, considering the size of the business being 206 billion, I would have expected to see a bit more, but um, it's not a huge red flag. Like they have got some skin in the game, but not a huge amount. So just something I'll keep in mind as well. Um, and as for the tenure though, it seems to be less than two years. So they're not, doesn't seem to be that experienced. Like they have a relatively high turnover, but um, when I read their profiles, I, I get more details on who they are and, and what their actual um, uh, working experience is. 
So the next part I look at, as I mentioned, is the ownership section. And that was just the insider buying and selling and seeing who's, who's doing what. Um, so over the last three months, I can see here, it looks like there's been a huge, in, not huge, relatively big insider buying um, from eight different uh, individuals. They bought about $4.7 million worth of stock. So that's pretty promising. I'll have a look at that. And then the uh, nine to 12 months ago, there was two individuals who bought around $2 million worth of stock. So it's good to see that the insider has been buying uh, and there's been no selling. So that's really promising. Um, and here's the details of the trades. So I can see they've all purchased roughly a couple hundred thousand dollars each, except for this gentleman down here bought 1.5 million. Um, but everything, okay, it was all that, that 25th, 26th, 28th. I think that's just after they reported actually. So they reported and then the stock went down and they've all been purchasing stock since they all purchased some stock after that decline. So that's interesting. Um, maybe it's like a vote of confidence. They're just like, yep, we, we believe the stock is um, a bargain now. Um, and the fact that it was many different individuals doing it is a pretty good sign. The fact that it wasn't just one person buying, it's like all of these different people have decided, yep, it's worth spending X amount of money on buying some stock. So that's a, that's a good signal to me. Like when it had its recent dip, apparently the management team or these individuals here who seem to be both in the board and members of the management team, um, they seem to believe that it was worth worth buying. So good stock to uh, good sign to see. Uh, next, I just have a look at the ownership breakdown just to get an idea of who the biggest shareholders are. Um, and it looks like institutions are a huge shareholder, and this kind of makes sense. Intel's like a blue chip stock, so they own two thirds of the company. Um, so they have quite a lot of sway say in what. Um, Oh, sway still works. They have a lot of sway in, in how things go at the business. So when there's anything to be voted on, um, like uh, in, uh, compensation and um, re re signing of particular members of the leadership team and board and stuff like that, um, they'll have a lot of say with their votes for all their millions and billions of shares that they have. Um, and then the general public makes up the remaining third of the share registry. So that's just individuals, investors, and, and stuff like that. Um, and then the, like I said, individuals actually don't, sorry, insiders don't have the biggest stake, which is like not a red flag, but it's just a bit concerning. I'd like to see more. Um, so I might monitor over the next year or two and see if they actually do purchase more stock considering the next couple of years aren't expected to be that great. Um, and then these entities don't own much at all. Good thing is though, um, next thing I check for is if shareholders have been diluted significantly. So if there's been any excessive issuing of shares, um, that basically means it's decreasing everyone's slice of the pie. Um, so if I if I was a shareholder right now and, and they had diluted me, my I would have less of a, my slice would be smaller. Uh, it's good to see that if I was a shareholder, they haven't haven't done that. So it's good to see. Um, and then just this last bit gives me an idea of the registry, the top shareholders, and it seems to be like 25 of the the top 25 own roughly 40% of the company. So. As we saw, it's basically primarily all institutions, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, Capital Research, um, stuff like these guys, they own the most, they're the top 25, they seem to own most of the shares. So just interesting to know, but it's like it's a blue chip stock, I kind of expected that, um, seeing the fact that it's um, such a such a well-known and big business. Uh, yeah, and then that's pretty much the end of the report. So now that I've looked at all that, um, what it tells me is like the dividend seems really safe, even though future earnings are expected to decline over the next couple of years, um, the dividend seems to be safe and there's even room for them to continue increasing it like they have recently. So if I was buying the stock for its dividend, I would be relatively comforted the at the fact that even though earnings are, uh, don't look too good, it's not at risk. Um, in terms of its value, it seems like it's very cheap um, and that might be because also there's not very high expectations for earnings growth. Um, and according to simply Wall Street's valuation model, it's also trading a discount to its future expected cash flows. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go and have a look into, into all the investments that they're making and try and make my own judgment on it. Um, its balance sheet's pretty good. Um, it can afford it, its debt, but I want to look at the debt maturities. So I want to check out when they're expiring and when they're coming due. Um, and its track record's been okay. Um, not, not outstanding, but it's not, um, not too horrible. So yeah, next steps are I'll go and look at all those investments they're, they're making. I want to look into all those capital expenditures they're going to do because I saw that they were like 20 odd billion dollars a year for, um, or so for a couple of years. And I want to see what impact they could have on the top and bottom line, revenue and earnings. Um, so if it's, if it's like a short term, a couple of years of investment, then if I'm a patient investor, which I think I am, I would be happy to wait and actually accumulate a position in this stock. Um, 
if it seemed to be that there was going to be huge demand for when those huge capital expenditures started to pay off. So if they took a couple of years of like underperformance, but then they had a massive um, success in the future, given that they were then ready um, and working, then that might be something I'm willing to play, like a couple of years worth of underperformance that could be a really big payoff. So that's what I'm going to go look into. Um, and I'll also read into all those insider trades were good to see. Uh, I won't read too much into them because they're, they're purchases. They weren't sales, so they weren't concerning. Um, but yeah, because I'm interested in the stock, I'm going to add it to my watch list. And now I'll get notified by Simply Wall Street about any sort of really important updates, um, whether it be reporting season, but they've already had that, um, or insider trading, uh, insider transactions, and stuff like that, dividends as well. So I'll be getting notified by Simply Wall Street about that. But those will be the next steps I look into um, for researching Intel itself. And if I'm not, if I don't find those future investments that they're making now too appealing, and like I don't think they're going to be as good as the company may think they're going to be, um, I'll go and have a look at these other players in the semiconductor industry as I saw, like Nvidia and AMD, uh, and I'll I'll do the same sort of research with them, read through the company report, and then go do some digging deeper. So yeah, that was pretty much me going through Intel. So I hope that was valuable, and thank you so much for watching. See you later.